In this chapter, we'll introduce a new quantity called linear momentum. Well, actually, you've seen it before, uh, but uh, we'll see the role linear momentum plays in collisions. Okay. So, uh, we'll introduce linear momentum, collision impulse, uh, conservation of linear momentum. You will learn that in collisions, in all collisions, uh, momentum is linear momentum is conserved meaning linear momentum before the collision is equal to linear momentum of the system after the collision. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we'll classify collisions as inelastic and elastic collisions. Uh, in all collisions, momentum is conserved. Momentum is conserved. In an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved and in an elastic collision kinetic energy is conserved okay so um, so we'll define a con so in this chapter we define another conserved quantity linear momentum so uh, there are some events of so collisions explosions where uh, a, uh, a quantity is conserved and that happens to be linear momentum so, uh, which, uh, which will put an additional constraint on how systems evolve in time. So, to, since um, collisions have to conserve momentum, um, that puts a constraint on how, how, what kind of collisions you can have. Okay, and that's what the statement is. So, conservation of momentum is useful for understanding collisions. Um, so, the quantity momentum is just as powerful and important as useful as energy. Okay, so let's uh, see mathematically what we'll do in this chapter. Okay, so here's Newton's second law. Okay, so mathematically here's what we'll do. We'll, um, we'll consider two different situations uh, in this chapter. The first thing we'll look at is situations where the force acting on an object is a function of time. So the net force acting on an object is a function of time. So I'm just giving you a mathematical overview of uh, what we're doing. So this will be a situation, so for instance, if you're playing a golf or something, the force that the club exerts on the ball will be a function of time. And we want to see what is the effect of that force on the golf ball. All right, so in situations where this is true, what we'll do is we'll integrate this. And again, you'll see all of this throughout the chapter dt. And that'll equal dp by dt. Okay, so what we've done is, here's the equation, here's Newton's second law. So all we've done is integrated the left-hand side, and so you have to do the same thing to the right-hand side. And so um, this left hand side, okay, I'll write uh, this guy, this area under the curve is called an impulse. And people use I or J to represent impulse. And this from, from the um, all right, I'll just use J here, just not to confuse anybody. And this is equal to P evaluated at the final point and the initial point. Okay, so P final minus P initial. Okay, and momentum, as you know, is mass times velocity. Okay. All right, so what we're saying here is this area under the curve, which is called the impulse that the club exerts on the golf ball in our example, shows up as change in momentum of the golf ball. Now the golf ball was sitting on the T initially, so this was zero. So the impulse tells you how fast the golf ball will take off from the T. Okay. So that's the first thing we'll do. And the second situation we'll consider is the following. This is, uh, uh, again, Newton's second law. Okay, now 
force, the net force is generally equal to the external force acting on the system plus the internal forces. Internal forces are when two cars collide, so one car exerts a force on the other car and the, likewise the second car exerts a force on the first. So, but from Newton's third law, all internal forces, action and reaction, add up to zero. So now we'll consider situations when external forces on the system are zero. And then dp by dt will be zero, meaning p is constant. So what we're saying is, uh, so now look at uh, collisions, for instance. In collisions, uh, <clears throat> the external forces acting on the on colli during collisions will be zero, at least during the length of the time of the collision. We'll ignore frictions and all, so for short enough time. So we'll consider situations when external force is zero, dp by dt is zero. So the momentum is constant. So the momentum of the system before collisions is equal to the momentum of the system after the collisions. So that's what this chapter is. So and the entire chapter. So we'll consider situations when the force is a short-lived force and is a function of time. In those cases, we calculate something called the impulse. And the impulse is the effect of the impulse on the object on the effect of the impulse on the object on which the force is acting is it changes its momentum. All right, so that's a brief summary of the chapter. So again, we're talking about linear momentum. So let's uh, consider this first case first. So here's the situation, you're playing baseball, the ball is coming, there's the initial momentum of the ball. And then the bat acts on the ball and it changes, changes the momentum of the ball from this to that final momentum. Okay. Again, momentum, as we said, is a vector. It's uh, mass times velocity. And Newton, in fact, uh, gave a second law as the net force acting on an object is equal to rate of is the time rate of change of momentum of the object again okay, this uh, table lists uh, lists uh, uh, momenta of various objects so for instance a charging rhinoceros has a moment of 3 times 10 to the 4 kilograms meters per second which is similar in momentum to them um, to a car moving on a highway okay the reason we're listing this is, okay, so if you want to stop the car or the rhino, you know what the change in momentum has to be. And if you want, depending on how fast you want to stop these objects, that'll tell you what kind of forces you need. Okay, so that's why we list that. So you need similar forces to charge, to stop a charging rhino or a, or a car moving on a highway. Okay, and uh, here is a, uh, and you can see that to stop a super tanker is a hundred thousand times harder. All right. So uh, here is a situation we encounter again. F is dp by dt. Okay, so let's say uh, you, so somebody gets in a wreck. And they're going at 80 miles an hour. So, and you want to stop them without doing any harm to them. So you, you know what, so their initial momentum was mass times 80 miles an hour in appropriate units. And then you want to stop them. So you know the change in momentum. Now, the longer the time over which you change the momentum, their momentum, the smaller the force. Okay. So the idea is the longer the time over which the, you stop them, the smaller the force. Now, if the steering wheel stops the person, then it sh the steering wheel would stop the person in a very short time and they would experience large forces. And of course, that would not be good. So the idea of the seat belt is it extends this time of stoppage. Okay, so the seat belt cushions their fall, so to speak, and it extends the time of stoppage and then the force of them are smaller. Okay. So that's the idea of these safety devices. 
All right, so if you consider a system of particles, so here's a system of particles. This is the moment of this particle, moment of that particle, moment of this particle. The moment of the entire system is just the sum of all the momenta. And it turns out that Newton's second law applies to a, a one particle or a system of particles. So this, this law would be valid for a system of particles as well. So this would be the net force on the entire system and that's equal to rate of change of momentum of the entire system. All right, so now let's consider the first situation we talked about. The force acting on an object is a function of time and then it's short-lived, okay? So what this diagram is showing you is the force that the golf club exerts on the golf ball is like this, okay? So before the club comes in contact with the ball, the force is zero, and then as the club, club comes in contact with the ball, the force rises and then goes back to zero. And this force can last some anywhere from 50 to uh, 100, 150 milliseconds. And this peak force, this peak force can be as large as 2,000 times the weight of the ball. So when the club is acting on the ball, you can ignore all other forces. There is uh, the force of gravity, the normal force, friction force. So for instance, there are all these other forces that I'll draw. Okay. The force of gravity, the normal force, and the friction force. But I'll exaggerate this. The force that the club exerts on the ball is much much greater than any of these other forces so we can act like for this short time this is the only force acting on the ball and that's the impulsive approximation anyway so now here's what we'll do we'll uh, integrate this so a useful way of describing this is we'll integrate this both sides dp by dt and the right hand side is from an initial time to final time p final minus p initial and this area this integral is this area and that is called the impulse okay. all right so here we go so there's the equation we'll integrate this side that's called the impulse and that's equal to change in moment of the ball so large and so so in our example of golf that was zero the final velocity of the golf ball will be greater greater this area greater the impulse greater this area okay so when tiger woods plays golf his the impulse he imparts this area is much much larger than when i play golf okay and his golf ball takes off much faster than when I play golf. All right, so let's pause right now.